It's great to have you here on the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. I have to start out with some not so great news about where we are on a glide path to being comfortable in retirement. And got a counterpoint much later in the podcast. Do you know there's a way for you to get cell phone service for free? That's right. Zero dollars. It's a blast of the past. I'm going to tell you how it works. So there's an organization at Boston College, the home of... What a fine institution. Krista DiBiaz and her daughter, Claire, is now a legacy who will be a... Junior. Junior this fall. Wow. She's doing much better in school than I did, let me tell you. She really is. Yeah, my kids, too, did better in school than I did. Anyway. (laughs) We turned out okay. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Well, this report from Boston College, which Boston College has had for decades, the what they call the Center for Retirement Research, and they crunch numbers on a number of facets about uh, how people are doing in retirement, how they're doing on saving money for retirement. And it has been true all through the years in the research they've done that people at the lower end of the income ladder have struggle more in retirement. Duh, that's not a shock to anybody. The number, the percent of people in lower income that are struggling in retirement is actually less than it used to be. So people are doing a little better in lower income groups. And people in middle income are doing better than they were, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. The stunner? Okay, this is crazy. Uh, People that are high income earners, 28% struggle in retirement because they don't save money over their working lifetime. I get it for people that are low income earners who struggle in retirement because they're just trying to keep the lights on. They're just trying to put food on the table. High income earners? All right, I got to say something cold. Almost always, it's a lifestyle thing. And people at the higher end of middle income earners, it's a lifestyle thing. It really is about habits and how you handle money. You know how, I'm going to talk about something we know is true. You can have siblings in the same family. Obviously, siblings, same family. And one will be really somehow magically able to live comfortably, save well, and be A-OK. And another will always be short of funds and always be asking for a loan from the sibling who's good with money. I know a lot of people in that situation. There are anonymous heads going up and down here in the podcast studio. I mean, it is just a fact that it's in a lot of it if you are... um, in a position where you're making decent money, it's up here, it's in our heads. It's in our attitudes. It's in how we live our lives. And there are people who everything is about the adrenaline rush of today's spending. And the idea of deferring wants to build financial independence is just not for them. But the reality is the tension it creates in your life, the anxiety it creates in your life, it's not worth it. Now, there are people who can get 
into their head in over their heads financially and they sleep fine every night never seems to bother them till the bill doesn't get paid but it really is having these attitudes about money where you decide that hey it's a good idea to have that cushion there it's a good idea to build up that reserve and this is something that if you listen or watch this podcast, it's something that you're likely already about or you're trying to get there. And it's a tough juggling act. How do you pay today's obligations and deal with the future, whatever that may entail? Emergency fund, saving to buy a home, saving for retirement, all these things are a juggling act. But the core, the key of all of it is throughout your working lifetime, unless you earn a poverty scale wage, it's about living on less than what you make, period. The old way of saying it, old, old phrase, pay yourself first. What does pay yourself first really mean? It means you put money aside for your future needs. And I talk about the oops a lot. There are financial oops regularly in life. And you have to be prepared for those. So that's why the oops are part of the picture. That there is going to come a time where oops... This broke, or that happened, or the other happened, and you have to cover an emergency expense. And that's why the rainy day is important. And retirement, as I've always said, there's no scholarships for retirement. And so when I see this Boston College data, that between a quarter and a third of high income earners are at risk for poverty in retirement, it speaks to lifestyle choices and living for today and not preparing for tomorrow. Fact. Again, a different situation than people making a lot less money. So if you make good money and you're not really saving like you potentially could, something for you to think about and you do it one step at a time. You don't turn the ship around instantly it takes time but it also takes a determination that the change is something you're going to make krista okay i was trying to find the four boston song i was going to play it but i, I will i will refrain that's our school. well you can sing it for us. no that's okay steven in virginia says i've been seeing a dermatologist for an annual checkup for skin cancer for a few years. I paid my bill at the office each time and have never had a delinquent account. I was notified that their new policy is that a patient must provide them with a credit card to keep on file, which they will turn over to their bank. The policy states credit card on file will be used to pay account balances after insurance adjudication, which remain unpaid for 60 days and co-pays and balances due for telehealth visits only. Since I've never not paid a bill, I refuse to expose my credit card to yet another secure database, supposedly secure, that could be vulnerable to hackers. My appointment was canceled because I would not comply. The claim They claim this process is a new standard in healthcare. While it certainly provides them a way to avoid turning bills over to collection, it puts the patient and consumer financial information at risk. I now need to find another dermatologist. What do you think? Stephen, um, this came up before. And we had a suggestion from a listener that I thought was actually a great idea. There are these um, stored value cards you can get that uh, only have on them what you put on them and don't expose you to unlimited risk of a criminal having that card number and running off with it because you know medical offices are notorious for not being good at securing people's personal information, financial information, social security numbers, the rest, and it would solve the problem. So you can buy, there are several sellers of these. 
Uh, there's the American Express one that they sell at Walmart called Bluebird, or you can go to bluebird.com. There are several of these that have no fee depending on how you purchase them. Put some money on them. It would give you the number to be able to give to a doctor's office. So they have that on record. And if they try to charge something on it and the money's not there, then they have to then contact you like they would have in the past and say, hey, uh, your card was declined. We need some money. And then you can pay the balance. But this is an ongoing battle between doctor's offices and customers, the patients, because with insurance involved, you don't know what they're going to pay. Doctor's office may attempt to approximate the amount. They could be wrong. There's an unpaid balance. And for whatever reason, there are consumers, customers, uh, patients, if you will, who uh, look at a bill owed to a medical facility or a dentist as the lowest of low priorities. If they rendered a service, they deserve to be paid what they're supposed to be paid for it. I don't like the idea of the automatic charging that this dermatologist wants to do in your case because they may charge you for a balanced bill that under your insurance, you don't actually know. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't actually know that they're going to charge you that and you don't actually owe it under your plan and the bill may have been coded incorrectly at the dermatologist's office, whatever, and they're like, well, we just want our money, and they take it from you instead of getting it from insurance. I just don't like this practice in medicine at all. Is it the new way it's being done? Not necessarily, but it's something that I'm hearing more of. William in Nebraska says, I'm confused. I reduced my credit usage from 89% to 78% by paying some accounts down in the last few months, and my credit score dropped by 25 points. What gives? That is a puzzle. I have no idea, William, why it would have dropped, but your credit score doesn't truly heal until your utilization of cards goes below 30%. So the long-term play is what you're already doing, having dropped it from 89 to 78%. And the goal is to keep reducing the amount of the percent of available credit you're using, and you will see over time. I don't know why th this particular scenario happened, but long-term, as you pay that down and reduce the percent of your available credit you're using, you will see that score go up. I don't know if you've done so yet, but you should set up a Credit Karma dashboard where you can continually monitor your score for free, and you can see an approximation of your score every single day, updated every day, and they'll tell you the factors that are involved in moving the score up or down. I should tell you the scoring model that Credit Karma uses and a lot of other people use is extremely volatile, much more volatile, uh, almost without explanation, than the FICO score, which is the one used in 90 plus percent of lending decisions. But knowing even the, um, uh, at least to this point in my mind, the algorithms used by the Vantage scoring system, that, the, that there's a big push by the credit bureaus to have used in the marketplace, even though it's not as good a scoring model, in my opinion, as FICO, it gives you your sense of direction over time. And stay on the path you're on. Don't worry about this decline that happened on that particular day that you saw your score. Suzanne in Georgia says, my husband who listens to your show several years back added to his IRA a small position in an individual company stock. The reason was, quote, because people on Reddit think it will make money, end quote. Um, and she names the stock. I what's, told the, what's the stock? AMC. Oh, that was, uh, that was one of those things like GameStop. Yeah. And there were a few others that people were uh, from message boards on Reddit, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Reddit was a big We're getting place all for into. Spread. Um, and the IRA is held by Schwab, FYI. I told him at the time that a retirement account is no place for stock speculation and he should sell it and put the money into the target year retirement fund. He's over 40, but his retirement savings are under 25,000. 
Most of his IRA, I think, is still in the target year retirement fund. Several years later, I've now learned he never got rid of that stock and thinks there's no problem with this. Can you please explain why this is a very, very bad idea? I'm assuming any money it makes gets eaten alive by fees he doesn't even know he's paying. So no fee issue at all. And the buying and selling of the stock is commission-free now. And so there's there's no, uh, no pickpocketing going on by Schwab with him owning that individual stock. Um, the reason that you always hear me talk about target retirement fund, target retirement fund, target retirement fund in an, in an IRA or in a 401k at work, that unless you are someone who devotes enormous amounts of time to real research on companies, it's too much risk for you and your portfolio allocations will likely be out of whack. Um, Charles Schwab himself is a big believer in what he calls core and explore. The idea that most of your money should be in a broad-based thing like, uh, he doesn't say target retirement fund, but I do, where the money is widely diversified over hundreds or thousands of different stocks. And as you age, um, that more of the money is in things that are less risky than in the short term than stocks. Um, owning the explore part of what Chuck Schwab talks about is owning individual stocks. So you get the base down and that most of what you're doing overwhelmingly is broad-based funds. If you want to dabble in individual stocks, that's okay. Um, would I have done something highly speculative owning something like AMC? Not my wheelhouse, not my thing. But I don't think this is a, a disaster that he has that individual stock as long as most of what he's doing is in the target retirement fund. And when I say most, I'd say at least 80% should be in the core, maybe even higher, and then a small amount dabbling in individual stocks, okay. And I, I made this mistake once. I bought an individual stock and I lost a bunch of money on it and I learned my lesson. <laughs> so what do you do now? Oh, I just, everything's in funds. So I don't do that. Well, sometimes you got to be burned. But the problem is, especially if you have something like what they call the meme stocks, and you had a big run up in it, you're like, wow, this is what I should be doing. But when you play individual stocks, there's a lot more risk involved than when you go wide in the market. So there's nothing wrong that you bought an individual stock and yeah. lost money. Oh, no, I think it's a good thing. It, that's what I'm saying. It was a great lesson for me. So sometimes we have to get burned. But I'm not even sure it's a lesson. If you were doing the core and you made an oops on an individual yeah. stock, I don't see that okay. as necessarily a bad thing. It's not how I play the game, but I don't see that as a bad thing. Now, coming up ahead, I knew it was coming. I've been predicting it for years. Free cell phone service. Prior efforts at that fell flat on their face. Is the latest one going to fall flat on its face? Who knows? But it's out there. I am all about ways I can get something for free in, in legal. And doing things where there's a trade-off. And I've shared the various crazy things I've done in the past to get stuff for free, you'd have to pay for otherwise. And people are all ears right now being pressed financially from the overhang of the ugly inflation that we had for about 16 months. And so they're more receptive to ways to save money. I was reading a story uh, just a couple of days ago about how private labels are gaining market share in the United States, where the retailers, the grocery stores, the rest, have always wanted us to buy private label because they actually make higher markup on their store brands than they do selling the national brands. And you, in turn, save uh, typically 20 30% on your purchases. 
And that's fallen on deaf ears overwhelmingly in the United States. We have the lowest purchase percent rate in the developed world of store brands, which means the brand name manufacturers have been very successful at marketing why you should pay extra money for their brand names, but not so much right now. People are all ears looking for ways to stretch every dollar. And cell phone bills have become a big monthly expense for people. And one thing I want to say right off the bat, if this is you, hear me loud and clear. If you have been loyal to the same cell phone company forever, and you have not shopped your plan even with them, in forever, odds are you are greatly overpaying for your cell phone service. There are people that are creatures of habit that stay with the same brands year after year and pay so much more than other people that aggressively shop for the best deals. Now, I'm an extremist on this. Be aware, I am the opposite extreme. And so I try all kinds of freebies, and I'm getting ready to try one that we've talked about for a while on Clark.com, but I haven't actually tried it myself, and that's Text Now, which is a free cell phone service with unlimited talk and text in return for me putting up with ads on my phone. So you don't get any free data with that. If you want data, you have to pay for the data you use. And if you're a, a data hog using enormous amounts of data, it's not going to be a deal for you. But there are lots of people who use minimal amounts of data or frequently or mostly, most of us around 80% of the time, we're at trusted Wi-Fi with our cell phones. So we can get by with a lot less data than we might imagine and there are people who are even willing to not have access to data when they're out and about because they do most of the time. So I'm going to try text now and report back to you. But if you don't want to wait for what I discover, you can be a guinea pig too because you pay absolutely nothing other than an upfront cost for what's known as the SIM card to go in your phone. You can transfer a port over the number you already have, uh, you can get a new number, whatever you want to do. But the cost of the SIM ranges from a buck to, I had to pay five bucks for it. And then I have the unlimited free talk and text, and on my screen, I've got the ads. And I am absolutely fine with that. I have a pattern, a history of signing up for these things and seeing how they go. I remember years and years ago, there was a company from Europe that came here that with free cell phone service, and it was very difficult to use and eventually failed. And so that one didn't work out. We'll see if the text now has a sustainable business model that will give people free cell phone service. We recently talked about how you and I both used Freeway on the uh, to make long distance calls back in the day. Try to, to explain ads. to anybody under yeah. like 35, mm -hmm. you used to have to pay for long distance. I remember once- Try to imagine that. You had to pay for long distance? And I remember you used a, con when you and your siblings were having some conference calls together, you used a free conference call system, right? And there, yeah. you only, how many minutes did you have? You tell it better You got than I 40 did. minutes per conference call. Well, what we used to do is our mom, our mom had, she's, she died seven years ago, but she, the last 15 years of her life, had dementia. And I have uh, uh, two brothers and a sister, and we would have a monthly conference call talking through who was going to do this for mom and what's going on with this with mom and all that. Um, and so we would normally use my free service. And then if we went past 40 minutes, we had to start a new conference call. And my, my two brothers and my sister were like, 
this is ridiculous. I can't believe we got to dial into this thing again. Uh, but it was free. I think they there was some cursing, uh, calling you cheap something. Right? Oh, yeah, there was, there was some uh, choice words. But we were able to have those meetings at no cost. I'm willing to do stuff like that. You walk the walk for sure. Okay, uh, we'll go to questions. Sarah in Wisconsin says, this is just a friendly money-saving reminder. I recently went to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription. Through health insurance, it was going to cost me $48. So I simply asked what the price would be without health insurance. Only $20. Always take the time to ask if there's a price difference at the pharmacy. Okay, I want to thank you for reinforcing this, Sarah. Um, this is something you got to know. If you have employer-provided health insurance or a pharmacy benefits manager plan, it is a dirty, 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 rotten, ugly underbelly of health coverage in the United States, what goes on with prescriptions. So there are these kickbacks that for some reason are allowed in the United States. And what's the some reason? Because our Congress does not care about you and me. Your individual congressmen, your two senators, do not care about you and me. They only care about who gives them money. And so the reality is we have this ugly thing going on with 80% approximately of prescriptions in the United States, 80% approximately are generics. So what happens is the pharmacy benefits managers, our employer hires, they're just trying that the employer, they're trying to hold down what it costs them to provide us with a prescription benefit. So then you and I are billed at the pharmacy counter, net of the pharmacy benefit from our employers, we're billed an amount that's way in excess of what a cash payer has to pay for most prescriptions. So what I do when I get to the counter, I fill my prescriptions at Costco. And when I go to fill it, I say, uh, please fill it without using my prescription benefit. And almost always, it's much cheaper for me just to pay Costco's member price for a prescription than what's offered through me to me through work. And that's because the pharmacy benefits manager, in that case, is cut out of getting all their dirty money kickbacks from the pharmaceutical manufacturer. Kevin in Connecticut says, I recently received unsolicited correspondence from my State Department of Labor, which included a monetary determination for unemployment insurance. This was odd since I had not applied for unemployment and I am not eligible. I looked into it and discovered that it was identity theft. Ugh. Someone had applied for unemployment benefits using my social security number. I assume any payments would have gone to a direct deposit controlled by the scammers. I filed a police report and the officer who took my report said I was the third person that morning with the same story. I contacted the three credit bureaus to confirm the credit freezes I put in place years ago, thanks to Clark, and they were still active. I put fraud alerts on my accounts. I obtained copies of all my credit bureau reports and there was no suspicious activity. I'm sharing this in case your listeners encounter this situation. Don't ignore unsolicited correspondence from the Department of Labor in your state. This goes in waves and we heard a lot of this back in 20 when there was the massive wave of unemployment early in the COVID era. And back during the Great Recession over and over and over again, we heard this for roughly a five-year period with the false claims for unemployment involving identity theft. Most Department of Labor's, most um, labor departments, state departments of labor, can I spit that out? That pay out unemployment compensation. Do not go through a process where they truly verify the individual applying for unemployment. Criminals know this, and it's been rife with fraud. And the state labor departments look at their job as paying out unemployment benefits as quick as they can. Criminals take advantage of that, and then it looks like you applied for unemployment. 
Now, depending on your state, there may be a standard procedure you do with your state, but what you said is so key. Never ignore those letters on determination of payment of unemployment because you want to clear your record with your state. And thank you so much for bringing it up. It was something we heard constantly three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, yours is the first one like this we've heard in a long, long time. Yep. Tony in Texas says, Clark, I remember when LED bulbs first came out, they were going to revolutionize lighting. Last for over a decade, low heat, low electricity use. Fast forward in the last several LED bulbs I've bought from various big box stores have died well before their incandescent counterparts in my house. Is this just a coincidence? Is there a real difference in quality of bulbs based on where you buy them? I would say that um, the quality of the bulbs really is the issue, that LED bulbs, in theory, should last a long, long, long time, potentially more than 20 years. And if yours are constantly burning out prematurely, it means that the big box store you're buying them from is selling you junk. There is one thing I have found out that the hard way, my bathroom lighting, fix, lighting fixture only, you know, it says how many watts of a bulb you can use. So if you buy an LED bulb that is the equivalent of more wattage than what your, your fixture can support, it will die pretty quickly. Prematurely. Well, you know, an LED bulb should give off much more light than an equivalent anyway. I have not had the experience you're talking about except rarely with LED bulbs. And I don't know which big box you're buying them from, what brand they are, but that's not been a specific problem for me. But I've certainly heard it from other people. And so um, if you're buying them from a big box and they're burning out prematurely, I'd go back to the big box and at least they can replace the product because what does it say on the box? I bet it says uh, that it will last for X number of years and yours apparently aren't making it six months. And that's a problem, obviously, for your wallet. And so I would make it clear that you didn't get the product you were paying your good money for. I remember when you were selling a condo you had... And you had replaced all the bulbs. Was it, was, was it fluorescence or early, early LEDs? Early, okay. I had, uh, yeah. Okay, so this <laughs> condo, I had all um, those compact fluorescent bulbs. Yes. That was a whole different era. And those were not really supposed to last that long. They lasted, almost all of them were still working like 15 years later after I put them in. And the place didn't show well with that. It looks like an office building, well, really. Well, Lane hated them. Yeah. Well, I liked what it did for our bill. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I had to change all those out. And then I took them to Home Depot, because I don't know if they still do, but they would recycle the old compact fluorescent. But every single bulb there had lasted for almost, I guess, 15 years and those weren't even supposed to do what the LEDs do, that they last and last and last. So, <laughs> I loved it. I remember how upset you were when the realtor was like, um, the real need The to... real estate agent was, all these lights need to go. I was crushed. You were. So I did what I was told. I replaced them with LEDs. Now, I was selling the place I could have just put in. At that time, you could still buy... Uh, cheap incandescence, the LEDs were more. But I didn't want whoever was buying the place to have a big electricity bill for lighting. So I replaced them all with LEDs. And so I'm really sorry about uh, the LEDs letting you down. You just have a crummy brand that you bought, or maybe more than one crummy brand. Or check, you your, check your fixtures. They should say on them the maximum wattage. They will say watt. the maximum wattage. So... Thank you so much for being with us today. I know talking about the CFLs and the LEDs will generate some unhappiness. Remember, Clark Stinks is there for you. Talk about me with my harebrained crazy schemes that I'm always into. So Clark.com slash Clark Stinks is where to post that.
And I hope you are enjoying our podcast. If you are, subscribe to it wherever you listen or watch. And if you enjoy what we're doing, share it with a friend or family member. Um, If there's somebody you don't like and you hate our podcast, share it with them too. (laughs) Have a great day.